regardless of where you live in the world. And now I'm even learning and have been studying research that says that from the time a baby is being created inside of a mother, that that ability to communicate back and forth with the mother is taking place at a chemical level in the same way that we translate it into a verbal level. So we, it's like awakening to a, a capacity that we have and then figuring out how to use it. So I think that we are at a time in history where we have to step back and say, what's the power and importance of our conversations with each other? And how does it take place? And how do we enhance it? And how do we teach it in schools? So for all the people that are listening today that are teachers and educators, I got a fellowship to study um, early childhood education. So I was looking at, and my professor was brilliant. She was into neuroscience before anybody else that I knew. And her husband was from GE and he was an electrical engineer, or a mechanical engineer or some kind of an engineer. And we worked as a team to build an environment that was called the Edison Responsive Environment. E-R-E -E is what they called it, the Edison Responsive Environment. You could look it up on the web. There's still lots about it. And we, it was a big typewriter that we programmed at different levels to see how we can help children learn, and this is the key, learn through their artwork and through their stories. Not through books that other people wrote, but books that they wrote. And we did this because we believed that if they were learning about their world and how they saw their world, that they would learn differently and better. And we studied them for 10 years. So we followed the kids in this program. Now that's a big piece of research. So if you go online, you'll see the, the right anecdotal stories of what teachers say about them. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, most of the kids had IQs that grew 15 points. So if they were 85, they would be 100. If they were 100, they'd be 115. If they were 135, they would go up to 150. And we studied this and, and the teachers kept saying, what are you doing with these children so that they are so different? They had confidence and character and strength of being and identity and all those things. So instead of teaching people, this is such a great principle, instead of teaching people to read Dick and Jane books or books about other people, have them write books, write books about their life, and then learn how to read and write through what they've created. And everything will change for that child. So I did, I did read about your research and, uh, you know, that is something that I want to share with everybody on the group and I'm going to do that. And uh, basically the agenda for uh, this webinar was to understand what conversational intelligence is all about. So that mm -hmm. uh, when we go ahead and buy your book, we, we know that, you know, these are the things that we can do and uh, we can take back in our classrooms. So uh, Judith, if you could just share a few tips about uh, how we teachers can uh, probably, you know, work uh, with children in classroom using conversation and intelligence. First, first, before I get to the classroom, let me give you a story that was one of the most powerful things that happened to me in learning how people are using this work and, and how they could use it. Because um, I'm a big student of case studies, like what happens in real life. So I have this great idea and I want you to eat this cake. And I'm going to tell you that you're going to feel so good after you eat this cake, your life will never be the same. I want to make that true. I don't, I don't want to tell people that, you know, so, so what happened is I was giving my immersion sessions for an hour and people all over the world signed up. We had 25,000 people sign up to listen over nine different sessions. It was quite a, quite a big deal. And I got a call after one of the sessions from a woman from Australia. And she said, can I take five minutes of your time? And I said, sure, tell me, who are you? And you know, what do you want to talk about? And she said, I want to talk about my daughter. And I said, well, what, what do you want to, you know, tell me about you first. And she said, well, I'm a coach. Um, I'm a Harvard grad. I have an MBA from Harvard and um, I am doing coaching. I'm doing business and I work with um, uh, senior boards and people that run companies. And so she's pretty high up and she's calling me about her daughter. So I said, well, tell me, what are you experiencing about your daughter? She said, I don't know, but we've had to put her in. We've had to move to a farm. We have horses and sheep. She goes to a special school for children with disabilities. And we don't know what's wrong with her, but we don't think that the doctors know either. And so I, for some reason, I feel you can help. I said, do me a favor. Have a talk with your daughter. Have a conversation with, with her, okay? And in that conversation, leave space so that she can ask questions or she can connect with you based on what's going on inside of her. Um, 
listen to connect, not judge or reject. I said, you're a Harvard grad. I can hear your energy. You're a tough woman. You're going to win. And some of that energy is coming out in your frustration with your daughter. And I said, I'm not saying you're a cause of anything, but I want you to change something so you can see what the change does to your daughter. And so she asks questions for which you have no answers. Don't be smart. Ask questions for which you don't have answers. Listen to connect. These are some of our essentials. So I'm teaching conversational intelligence now by showing you that how I teach these three things that are the most, the most important, creating space, priming the space for trust, so that she doesn't think you're manipulating her or anything like that. Um, ask questions for which you don't have answers. Listen to connect and we'll give, we'll have to have your team go to the place in my book where they can find these so that they know that I'm, I'm giving really important lessons here. And, um, and then call me and tell me how the conversation goes. Well, she called me the next day and she didn't even know how to put words to what happened. She said, I've never had a conversation like this with my daughter. I said, so what did you learn? She said, so I'm a very big influence on her. I said, what do you mean? See, I'm asking questions for which I don't know. What, what, what do you mean you're a big influence? Well, I don't give her space to talk. And so I've interpreted the fact that she doesn't talk as a problem that she has. And so when I would go to doctors, I'd say, my daughter has this problem. So we've already labeled it a problem. It's her daughter's, not hers. And she's going to put her daughter. Anyway, the end of the story is that I've seen them. I went to Australia again. I met with them and their daughter. They came to the U.S. and met with me, with their daughter. And I saw, she watched me interact with her child. And we were both leaning in like this. Like, I couldn't wait to learn about her. I mean, I couldn't wait to experience this amazing person. I said to my colleague, I said, I think she's a genius. I think she's spiritually high, higher than most people are in the evolutionary chain for her age. And I can understand why she had trouble connecting with people. She had big ideas and didn't know how to express them. And it was taking her longer to try to find words to express what was going on inside of her. So I'm going to stop and see if this brought any insights to people, this story brought any insights to people. The end result is she's in a private school. She's the head of her uh, sorority. She doesn't drink. She drives. And she drives all the other kids around who are drunk. I mean, this story just gets better and better and better. She's won awards for the UN. Uh, there's a thing called Kids for the UN, and she was leading a group. She was leading adults. She is funny. All of the stuff that wanted to come out now had space. So, so that's that's a very valid uh, thing that you said. That we we often uh, we don't listen to connect. We often listen to judge, and that's where we don't give space to our students to talk to us in a way mm -hmm. that they really talk to us. I think mm -hmm. us educators would agree out there that. You know, we, we, we being in the rush, we, we rarely give them time to connect with us. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I want to I want to break what you just described. I want to break a chain in history, which is that teachers learn how to teach whatever the content is they're going to teach, and other people don't know that content, so they're the experts. Somehow, that's what kids experience, and that's why a lot of very smart kids don't don't finish school. Like uh, Bill Gates never finished uh, college or high school or something. And I know lots of people that just say, I can't do this. I, I have things that I'm working on it, and I want to work on them, right? And th they're not interested in what I want to work on. So, you know, so, so I want to hear what, what, what this strikes for people because I don't want all educators to feel like they're not good in, in who they are or what they've learned. But I want to expand their toolkit. And experiment, be experimenters. That's one of the big things on our dashboard. We have the word experimentor, mentor of an experiment, right? And that is, I want everybody in, to challenge their own belief systems about what is in the world and experiment with doing something that you never thought would be possible and then having help people help you make it successful. Because when we bring in others, then we, we can often do things we never thought possible. Mm -hmm. So. Fantastic. I also remember uh, last time that we spoke, you shared uh, the example of how students, uh, you know, connect with each other when they're involved in project work. So uh, if you could share uh, about oh. that as well. Thank you. I was wait. I had that on my checklist of something I hope we talk about today. Yeah. So there's this, there's um, about 30 years ago, there were a couple of uh, PhDs from Harvard who left Harvard together, the four of them, and said, we're going to do something in the world about education. Education is not going in the direction it should. And so they created an uh, organization called Expeditionary Learning, which was part of another group called Outward Bound. And it fit in there because they were doing things that were 
challenging. They were putting, taking kids on adventures and then learning around the adventure rather than having them read books. They read books, but they also got to do books. They got to be books. They got to take on the adventures. And they created what ended up being now called Expedition. It was EL Education is the, is the new name. EL Education. And if you look them up on the web, you'll see they have books and all sorts of things. And everything is based on projects. And it's kids pairing up with peers, either peer to peer or peer to group, and working together with a group. And their goal is to um, take on a challenge that is a, a, something going on in the world. So it's about they go out and look at the world and say, wow, I am interested in this and I would love to help see this better. And so they create these projects and their school education is they learn mathematics through their projects. They learn, learn music through their projects, everything so that it becomes them. And I've seen these kids stand up in front of a room of a thousand people when they were raising money this year for fundraising for expeditionary learning or EL education is what they're now called. I keep going back because I still have that last uh, name. Um, and they had these 15, 16, 17, 18 year old kids running the whole meeting, the whole event for two hours and sharing stories about how some one guy got uh, Dart Dartmouth gave him a full fellowship to go to Dartmouth. And each one was being honored because they were so far ahead of their peers yeah. and they had such purpose in life yeah. and they were so kind to the people that they worked with, their students and teachers and, and knew how to work through difficult situations. They just seemed to have it all. And so I love that EL is re replicating that and bringing in schools from all over the world to learn how to become EL certified. Yeah. So this basically helps them to uh, connect and grow together. So that's how it helps them to project work. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Very much so. I apologize for this. No I'll unplug it. <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah. yeah. So, Do you have questions? Qu yeah. Anybody has questions, you can uh, ask uh, Judith. Uh, Kamachi, uh, Sangeeta, anybody would like to ask uh, Judith questions about uh, how can we uh, implement the conversational intelligence in classroom, probably. And uh, also last time we also discussed about, uh, you know, when we have parent teacher meeting, it's uh, very difficult uh, for educators to get through parents. Because as you, uh, you know, last time we were discussing that we are often listening to judge, we are not really listening to connect. So yeah. uh, when we are in the parent teacher meeting, that time also it becomes essential for us to uh, actually just listen to the parents and understand what they are saying. Because I think what you shared last time about uh, uh, being there, um, connecting and uh, mm -hmm. you know understanding rather than judging will help us to uh, navigate our way through there. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes both you and the parents don't know the answer to what's going on with that child. Yes. You know, the some the child may be unhappy, and the parents are coming in saying, you know, my child came home and complained about that you made them sit in the back of the room because they were too noisy. Well. I mean, when I talked to my child, I found out they have lots of questions about what you're teaching and nobody's listening to them. And the, pa and the teacher must be saying, this child is raising their hand all the time. All they want is attention. So you have one interpretation and another interpretation and then you have a young child who's sitting in the middle of these interpretations. And I think both parties want the best for the child and the teacher also has a vested interest in the whole group, right? Everybody that they have to take care of. So it's not easy. There's not a one answer answer to how to make it better, except when you share the challenge that you're facing with someone and they understand a little bit more, not to complain, but to say, you know, I wish I had a better way to handle 35 children in a classroom or whatever the issue is. I'm, you know, making this up because I don't know the situations, but you know, it's how do you get, how do you cross over, those difficult conversations and have people come away feeling you listened. Just what you said, you listened, you heard me. Yeah. And, and also you, the, what, what we discussed last time is that when children feel that they are not being heard to, you know, what goes through them, you know, because they often complain that teachers are not listening to us and, you know, teacher uh, didn't uh, want to, so they assume that the teacher doesn't want to talk to them and the teacher is not interested in them. So what, mm -hmm. what the effect it has on the child in that Oh my goodness, there, there are many students I know who have left school in sixth grade yeah. because they just, they were, they were full of 
energy and ideas and curiosity, but it didn't fit in the classroom. I know my grandson, for example, at the age of maybe he was four, whatever, four or five. So he's in the first year of kindergarten, I guess. And we came in for parents' day and Gideon got up and he was walking around and he was touching all the things on the shelf and looking at the books. And the teacher said, Gideon, sit down. And he said, I can't. And she said, why? I have to walk around. He knew that he was full of energy. He couldn't get rid of it. And if he sat down, he'd doing other things, right? So these are the things, I guess, education is becoming more than just educating knowledge. It's really it's educating the whole child and trying to understand. As it turned out, they got him a tutor. Now, this was in kindergarten or first grade. They got him a 10th grade math tutor for him. And that's what he needed. His brain was looking at, he was always looking at spaces and shapes and relationships and arithmetical things, always. He would look at, at um, when we went into supermarkets or into stores where they had tiles on the floor, he'd count the tiles that were black. And then he'd count the tiles that were right. And then he'd say, why did this pattern come up? And, you know, every child has their own unique interest in the world. The buttons get turned on and off at the moment of birth. And some might be more mathematical. Some might be more musical. Some might be more whatever. And patients, uh, parents and teachers, but teachers in particular, have a big challenge which is how do we teach them what is universal knowledge that we think they should have and still honor the child's unique growth pattern and who they want to become in the world. So I don't know if that's the challenge that your teachers that are online are, are facing, but I, I know, you know, I, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. What's the one, uh, you know, takeaway that you would give to uh, the educators to uh, consciously follow conversational intelligence? is, is um, allow, practice uh, keeping a journal. Um, notice what you notice. Notice, for example, in your classroom, um, did you notice the children that uh, were annoying? Is that what drew your attention? Did you notice the children that were quiet and why? And so get to see what, you, what you're taking in as what you feel is important to understand and to interact with. and. In, and you'll start to see patterns that you might uncover that are unconscious. Oh, I don't like the ones that walk around or stand up or do this. And I've labeled them a certain way. Get to understand how you label people because how you label them determines how you interact with them. So. Interesting. How we label them depends on how we can uh, interact with them. Uh, yeah. Can you give an example for this, if possible? You want an example for that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was my Gideon example when the teacher found him annoying. And she said, Gideon, you're annoying. You get up and you're walking around the classroom. That annoyed her. She was trying to run a meeting. She was trying to have parents have a good experience. They came there to meet the teacher and learn what the teacher was teaching the kids. And here you have this little boy upstaging her and walking around the room and, and, Bob, and you know, being annoying. And so she didn't handle it well. And made him feel really bad. And from that, then they went to the psychologist at school, and they had him tested. And then they wanted to put him on Ritalin, because Ritalin is for hyperactive kids. And lo and behold, they did some other testing to find out that he was mathematically so far ahead of any of the kids that he was bored. He really was. And that's when they got him the tutor. So that's, that's a story of um, labeling that can be harmful. And then how to switch the label to this is an annoying child who is not fit for our classroom. And he may not be fit for the classroom, but they, fortunately, my daughter took him out and said, I'm going to get him tested again. We're going to figure out what, what he needs. And lo and behold, his, when they tested him on IQ and mathematics and, you know, all those things came up, he was so far off the charts. They almost didn't have a, a thing. He, he, now he builds computers by scratch. He makes them himself. He said he could redo my computer for me and it would be the best thing in the world. And he took me to the stores where he finds all those parts. So his parents cultivated his unique ability instead of making him sit in a dunce chair, which I remember doing many times as a child. I would be asked to sit in a chair and I was being punished because I was annoying the teacher and asking too many whys. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, my origins are that little kid <laughs> that people wish they didn't have in the classroom. And so... I'm finding that a lot of those kids are smart and sharp and 
they make contributions to the world that are really wonderful. And we need to listen, make, create space yeah. for them to grow. Yeah, yeah. That's very important because many of us, uh, it's our inability to uh, handle uh, uh, students that makes us label them. And uh, yes. then it becomes a vicious circle where, you know, we find them annoying and they find us annoying and it just goes on and it stops. Exactly. Exactly. You've been there. You know, you know, we all know that, right? It's a pattern. Sure. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Great. Great. And uh, uh, one, one last uh, you know, request, if you could uh, share about your favorite teacher with everybody. Oh, my favorite teacher. Oh, yeah. My favorite teacher. So in fifth grade, I had a, an absolutely amazing experience that has marked my life. Miss Ciotti, I remember her name. Um, I remember her. I still have a video of what she was like. I invited her to my house so I could show my parents. This is a model of somebody that I just think is an amazing human being. And, and I want you to meet her. I just love her. And, and I want to be like her. And I just went on and on and on. So we brought her over. And I brought them in because my parents were caught in a, in a um, pattern of telling me what to do all the time. And, and I used to run away from home and I was very, I'm not the kind of person that takes that well. And so I wanted my parents to see an example of somebody who was interactive and what she used to do in the classroom, no other teacher had ever done. And what she did was she would ask us if we'd like to get into groups with people because she wanted to give projects to the, to the groups. She wanted to give them projects. And um, so every group got together. Then she said, you can go in any direction you want. I'm going to be teaching you some new things. So if any of the new things that I teach you get you excited, maybe your project could be around what you're learning. So she said, today I'm just going to share some new ideas with you. And she would always have things that were so way out there and different. And it wasn't like learning Dick and Jane and, you know, structured things that we used to know. She would always find articles in the newspaper, things in magazines, so that she was stretching us to see that education was going to help us become part of the world around us and that we would, we would be able to choose things that we love to learn and, and be able to research them. And it's like kids' eyes lit up. They just never heard anybody talk like that. It was always take a test. Let me give you a grade. If you pass, great. If you don't, then you sit in the dunce chair. And so anyway, that's it. So she would put us into good. We had the best year I've ever had in my life. I became ultra curious. I started to become more creative because she said, if you want to make a three-dimensional object that is your idea, then you just make it and bring it in and, and label it and tell us all about it. So she gave us the freedom to think so far out of our boxes that our, all of us, I know, will never forget her as a teacher because of that. So, so that's what I mean. How many people think each of you is a, a wonderful teacher? How many people say you changed my life? How many people say, I can't wait to have you again? Please come back and teach me. You know, we spend a lot of time with our, our kids when we're teachers. It's more time than parents. So it's great to, when I go to Parents Day, to see my kids have a smile on their face and say, this is the teacher I told you about who I love so much. Yeah. <laughs> so she created space and that's what uh, was required. Of yes, exactly. Yeah, she created space for learning, not for teaching and memorizing, yeah. but for learning what's important to us. And that became a motivator for our future life as an adult because we had a purpose. We had things that we... Some of the YouTube videos I've heard you saying that, uh, you know, progressive leaders are those who create space for their employees so that you know, they can come up with ideas and then, you know, those ideas can be implemented. So, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and to follow that up um, with, with a story, there was a, a, a fellow from Barclays Bank who used to come and meet with me every um, Tuesday in the morning for an hour, an hour and a half. And he would um, share with me things that, based on what he was learning from conversational intelligence, he would say, these are the things I want to do differently. So I'm going to share these with you, and you tell me if they're good ideas. And we'd talk about ideas, and sometimes it would change how he did things in front of a group. Sometimes it would be how he involved people. He had all sorts of things that were great questions to, to learn about. One day, it was after work. It was not the typical Tuesday call. And he called me on my phone and he said, I need your help. Can you talk to me for a few minutes? And I said, yes, what's up? And he said, in a half an hour, I have to go into a meeting. 
and I wanted to share with you what my agenda is, and you tell me if the agenda is a good one. And so he shared with me his agenda, and I said, I said, I'd like you to do something really important. I said, I'd like you to flip your agenda completely opposite from what you suggested. And he said, what do you mean? He said, I, I, I opened up the meeting and I had people say, I, I told people what all the good things are that were happening in the bank. And, uh, and then I asked them if they had any ideas. So I shared with them what I knew. And then I discovered, he thought, because we talk about sharing and discovering. And sharing and discovering is good when you do it with other people in a level three conversation. But his sharing wasn't sharing. It was, let me tell you all the things that I've already figured out about the bank. Now, if you want to add something, tell me what you want to add. And I said, no, you ask them what they've learned about the bank. Okay. And then if there's anything else that you can fill in, you fill in and see what happens. And so he said, oh, I have to, yeah, I said, restructure your whole brain. That's it. Go in and do it. You're going to be great. And it turned out that his boss was in the room. And it was because he ran the meeting featuring the kids in the room or the people in the room. And then he added what was, quote, missing or what they hadn't been able to think about. The, te the, the leader said he is going to be a great leader. If that's what he does with all of his meetings and all of his people that work for him, he's going to be great. And so he got promoted. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Thanks to you, he got promoted. <laughs> yeah, and he, thanks that he he was willing to try it in a short short time frame. Yeah, exactly. So there are patterns. Is what I guess what I say is conversational intelligence. You ask me what it is. These are the interaction patterns that take place amongst human beings. And instead of just talking and asking, I found that there are three levels. And so in the book, you're going to see the three levels of conversation. And it talks about the first being very transactional. I tell you things. You ask me things. And I'm not necessarily building on top of something that we're talking about together, but I'm just kind of filling in the blanks in my brain. So I tell you, I, and you ask, and we can, transactional. It doesn't necessarily lead to a deeper relationship. It gives you credibility sometimes because people are comparing what they know and what they don't know. So there's a healthy version of that. And then there's an unhealthy. And the unhealthy is when somebody like me takes over and starts to talk a lot. And then how do you get into the conversation again? You know, that's, I'm doing a lot of telling now. My, my role is to share, okay? And so it's not telling at, but trying to share things that will spark interest, hopefully, for people. Um, level one. Level two is positional, where you take a strong position about something. You don't just tell them facts and data, but you're advocating for a point of view very strongly. And you're inquiring but a lot of times we inquire or ask questions in order to move people over to our point of view. That's positional, where we have a position. And that's common in conversations. And the last one, the share and discover, is creating a kind of an energy field around our conversation and say, we want to share and discover things, things that are very important to us, transparent. Can I trust that if I share things transparently that I'll be safe to talk with you? And so you set rules of engagement about what you can share and what you cannot share and how. And when that happens, the brain falls in love with that energy. The brain adores those kinds of conversations. It opens up the prefrontal cortex where a lot of new thinking can take place. It creates better judgment as it processes the world around us. Um, it it um, enables us to get to innovative solutions quickly. Like all of a sudden you'll say, oh, I just had an idea. Now, where did that come from? It came from this part of the brain being safe because the relationship is safe. It's not, I'm out to get you. I'm not here to one-up you. I want to learn from you and you learn from me and I want to support you and you support me. And when we teach people how to create classrooms or experiences inside of classrooms where people can be open and honest and transparent and feel that they have your back, then people learn better in education. People learn better in classrooms. People don't feel like they're just going in to get graded but they are there really to grow. I think this, uh, you know, the, the entire process of, of, you know, helping us to learn about conversation and intelligence is, uh, it's going to be useful when we, uh, you know, read your book on conversation and intelligence. So I think, uh, you know, I'm going to be sharing the link on the group and I request the educators to purchase the book and uh, because that's going to be the key for all of us to understand, uh, you know, in detail how we can actually incorporate uh, conversational intelligence in classroom. So yeah. I'm definitely uh, going to be uh, requesting all the educators to purchase uh, Judith's book. Judith's mm -hmm. book 
on conversational intelligence. In case anybody has any questions, you all can unmute the audio and uh, ask question. Anybody? I think everybody has their audio uh, mute as of now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Reshma, do you want to ask any question? Uh, Kanchan, Nirupama. Nirupama says she cannot wait to grab a copy of your book. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it took me many, thank you, thank you, thank you. It took me many years to put the science in without making it so overwhelming yeah. that it becomes, gets in the way. It's there just to teach you and have you become aware of, oh my God, is that what just happened in my brain? Or is that what I just did to that student? You know, they never spoke up before and now they seem to, what happened different? You know, it's, I'm th so thrilled. Thank you for saying that. So do Thank you. Kindle, Kindle version of your book? As yes. You as asking? Yes. 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 Yeah. We do have a Kindle version. Yep. Yep. And, uh, uh, you know, as I, I've always described, you know, whenever I have spoken about you on the group with the educators, I've always described that uh, the way you explain about conversational intelligence in lucid terms, I think, uh, you know, that has aroused interest in me and I'm sure today in other educators to actually grab a coffee and uh, understand what it is and change our own patterns of conversing with everyone around us. So, yep, exactly. That. Yeah, this uh, I'm, I'm going to be sharing uh, this video with uh, other educational groups as well. And uh, we're going to be hoping that more and more educators uh, get into the habit of uh, adapting to conversational intelligence. I try my best, but as you said, it's a pattern that needs to break. So it's yep. a practice, practice that we need to do. So I try, I try at home with my own children and I, didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I get annoyed and then there's there's a pattern wherein they are shut. They don't talk to me. I don't talk to them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful to you for all the knowledge that you have shared and for today's time as well. And uh, I, I really can't thank you enough for all, all the knowledge that you have shared with uh, the other educators as well. I think uh, there is some problem, internet connectivity or what. Uh, uh, two of them are messaging me saying that it was really nice and... Uh, Thank you, Judith, for uh, sharing your knowledge about conversational intelligence. So, mm -hmm. And they look forward to reading your book. Yeah, Wonderful, wonderful. And if anybody has stories that where they've experimented with their classrooms and then something exciting has happened, I, I would love to find out from you. So you, people can, through you, they can share the stories. And um, I'm writing another book that's going to go into what's going on when people have changed their conversations and it changes their life. So you might have some stories that we could write up in the book. Oh, wow, definitely. So I'm going to be using it and uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to be asking my children for the feedback. So they're okay. going to give me the feedback. <laughs> Great, that's terrific. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Judith. Thank you. You're welcome. And Alrighty. Uh, Take care, everybody. I, thank you. I will write yeah. to you, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Alrighty. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye.